Hello, everybody. Welcome to NJ Thrive's Small Business Webinars. You are attending our weekly webinar created webinars created to help New Jersey small business owners start, grow, and thrive. If you have been attending our webinars uh, in the past, thank you so much for your support. If you are new here and this is your first time attending, thank you for attending, and we hope that you continue to attend our webinars and take part in our resources and services. And today is Thursday, January 18th, and this is the week's second webinar. Oops, all right. So NJSBC, what does the acronym stand for? It's a little of a mouthful, so that's why we like to stick with NJSBC. It's America's New Jersey Small Business Development Centers Network. Uh, a statewide program powered by the SBA, Small Business Administration, and partners to help small businesses in New Jersey with three key things. No cost small business consulting, training and events starting at zero dollars, just like this webinar that you're attending, and exclusive small business resources. Um, so that's our organization. Um, and if you will, if you would like to go in the chat and tell us uh, who you are, what you do, um, where you're from, if you're from New Jersey, and, you know, what your small business is about, uh, feel free to share your contact information. I always like to say that you never know who you find, who you might find uh, in a networking space like this, not really in person, but a networking space like this. Um, so, yeah, feel free to share. And, just a heads up, the map that you see on the slide on the right there, uh, it is the state of New Jersey with all the counties. And wherever you see the small SPDC logos are where our regional centers are uh, throughout New Jersey. So if you ever are curious when you attend and go in and say hi in person, then that is where you would go. Um, or you could also go to njsbc.com and get to know us a little better. So what is on the agenda for today? We have a couple of headlines that we like to share with our audience, just things that have come up or that are happening will happen um, in the small business community uh, in New Jersey. Uh, then we have our presentation and then we'll have a Q&A session after. So these are our headlines. And all the links for these headlines will be shared in the chat. So America's Seed Fund Week, that's our first headline that is happening between January 23rd to 25th. It is virtual uh, three-day inclusive learning experience where attendees will deepen their understanding of America's Seed Fund, the nation's largest source of non-dilutive funding for high growth startups and small businesses. Um, if your if if your small business uh, is a tech business is you know uh, in that technology space, then we highly recommend that you attend this. Very valuable information. Uh, they will be having in person world tours, so you can tours so you can connect and register there. But all the event highlights are mentioned under here, this page. So recommend that you check out this page. Again, links will be shared. Second headline is a press release from the SBA. New business applications reach record $16 million under Biden-Harris administration. This is a press release, again, from the SBA, published on January 11th, so about a week ago. Um, so this is a celebration of new census data showing a record-breaking 5.5 million new business applications filed in 2023 alone. The U.S. has experienced first, second, and third strongest years of new business application rates on record. So something to celebrate. Very cool. And this is a background, so details on some of the milestones that have been hit. Third headline is January published on January 16th, so two days ago by NJEDA. They released a request for information to gather insights into arts and culture sector. So 
the RFI where it's okay right here the link for RFI is right here and you can click on that link to give any information that you would like re related to this topic and let me see okay as part of the Murphy administration's ongoing efforts to support arts and culture this RFI aims to build on the New Jersey State Council the arts tremendous knowledge base and community engagement process by exploring new and innovative funding solutions. All right. So those are our headlines. And moving on, some housekeeping rules that we'd like you to follow during this webinar. If you have any questions, type them in the Q&A box. You'll see that right next to the chat box. Uh, we like to save our chat box for remarks and comments or anything that you would like to share. And Q&A is for uh, to be addressed during the Q&A session. We do have a brief survey that we'd like to fill out. And when you once you fill that out, you'll receive the slides that our presenter is using today. And uh, during the survey, you can tell us what you liked, what you didn't like, what topic you would like to have, uh, you would like to see a webinar on things like that. Uh, and just one other reminder, not a really a rule, but one reminder is that this webinar is being recorded. It will be available on our YouTube channel and our um, NGSPDC uh, website, and it will be available there in one to two uh, business days. All right, without further ado, we have Caitlin today, who's the marketing director for GSI 1 U.S. Small Business Growth. Caitlin, thank you so much for doing this for us. And today's topic is very interesting because we've never had a webinar on this topic. So I'm sure our audience is excited to hear from you how you PC barcodes from GS1 lead to business growth. Thank you so much for doing this for us today. Sure. Yeah. Let me share my screens. Thank you so much for having me. Um, like you said, I'm Caitlin Friedman. I am the Marketing Dire Director for Small Business Growth at GS1 US. Um, let me put this into presentation mode. There we go. Um, I've worked at GS1 for uh, 10 years, and I really love collaborating with the small business community to kind of help you understand how this small but mighty barcode, you know, Uzma, you and I were talking about how you see a barcode every day. You never really think about the whole system that's behind it and yep. um, and how it really works, right? So mm -hmm. um, hopefully this will be uh, helpful for you to understand how it might fit into your business. Maybe just interesting as a consumer um, to know what's going on and how this um, this technology is innovating too. So um, if you'd like to, you know, put some questions uh, in the chat as we go along, I'm happy to answer, but um, but we would like to kind of save it for a Q&A at the end too. So um, I will do my best to answer any questions that you have too. Um, so before I get started, just um, I'm required to show these slides just to let you know that GS1 US is committed to fully complying with antitrust laws. We have a policy available on our website. Um, more legal disclosures. Um, basically, this just lets you know that all the information I'm going to provide to you is educational in nature, and you are free to make your own business decisions. We also ask that you refrain from recording your own versions of this presentation and only access it on YouTube and um, njsmallbusinesshelp.com after this event, as, as Uzma noted that those are the two locations where it'll be. Okay, so come with me behind the barcode. Um, this is just an agenda of what I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk about why do you need one for your business if um, if you're in the retail business. I see in the chat beforehand there were some uh, people in importing and exporting, so barcode is a necessity for that. Um, some acronyms that kind of get confused, the GTIN and the UPC, what's the difference? Um, something called the, pe the prefix that we offer and what, what kind of power the prefix has. Um, maintaining product data, which basically makes you a really good partner for your retail partners. Um, we're going to go through some packaging tips, some packaging hierarchy basics, um, and then what's next for the barcode. And, and I'll, I'll spoil it right away. The barcode is evolving into those QR codes that you see every day. And, and we're starting to see more and more, especially after the pandemic, right? I feel like we were scanning QR codes um, and that just became uh, more normalized, right? So, um, so we're taking that technology kind of to the next level in the retail space. And I can tell you all about that. 
advance my slide. There we go. Okay, a little bit more background about who we are, because um, sometimes we get like, uh, you know, your GSI or GS1. I've never heard of that, you know. Um, we're the organization behind that barcode standard and, and a lot of things that power the supply chain. Um, there's 116 member organizations. So I represent the United States member organization, but there's GS1 UK, GS1 France, GS1 China. There's GS1s all over the globe. Um, so we're neutral and not for profit. Um, neutral just kind of means that we uh, we collaborate with retailers and brands and distributors and hospital systems. Anybody that can um, use a barcode and, and kind of apply it to their supply chain or has an interest in making the supply chain better. Um, we're that neutral space where even um, competitors will come to the table at a GS1 event and say, OK, how do we move forward together? to make sure we don't have bottlenecks, we're serving the customer right, we're keeping that customer safer. You know, there, there are these, um, these great conversations happening um, where the, the good of the customer is being put first. Um, we're inclusive and collaborative. And, and like I said, we serve businesses around the world. And the beep of that barcode is heard more than 10 billion times a day. Those are, um, those are about as many transactions that are happening per day. And we actually think that that's a conservative number. It's probably much more. Um, so to be a little bit more specific about who GS1 US members are, they're small businesses like yourself. And um, I'm pretty proud of some of these videos that we have on our website. You can go to our nice QR code here, um, scan that. It'll take you to a playlist on our website where you can learn um, from the experiences of other entrepreneurs, like a small brewery, um, a seasoning company. Um, it just makes me smile looking at these folks because they they are so great at telling their stories. And, um, and hopefully you can learn something from their experience too. Okay, a little bit more about what uh, what entrepreneurs say about barcodes, just to open this this thing up. Um, this is uh, our friend Lisa Lane uh, from Millstone, New Jersey. So a couple of New Jersey entrepreneurs to to tell you about. Um, she's the founder of a company called Rinseru. Um, it's a cute name, right? Um, it's an at home shower cleaning and dog washing product. It's very very innovative. Really really cool idea. And she's actually just on our podcast, so you might want to check that out on our website too. GS1 US has a podcast. She said, um, I just knew that I had to do this right the first time. This barcode goes onto every single box that I make, and there's no way I can go back and redo this. There should never be a question that this product is linked to my brand. And that's exactly what a GS1 barcode does. It helps link your product to your brand. Okay, and then we have Andrew Jacobs, who is from Northvale, New Jersey, up in our um, northeast, uh, northwest quadrant of the state. Beautiful place up there. Um, he is the president of Jam Paper and Envelope. And so he said, when we were first starting out with e-commerce, you know, they were traditionally um, a brick and mortar store and they decided to get on Amazon. When we were first started uh, with e-commerce, we used these third party barcodes and they worked for a few years. But when we started working with the major online marketplaces, they told us that they were just not going to work and that they required GS1 barcodes. And here we are almost 10 years later, still cleaning up that mess. So because GS1, we kind of invented the barcode. We're where it all started. That, that collaboration that we were talking about is where... Um, retail executives got together and said, there needs to be a better way to get people through this checkout line faster than keying in all these codes. Um, so we, we can help um, make sure that those barcodes are unique. The third party barcodes that he's talking about um, might have been recycled barcodes, might have been reused. We don't really know. But Amazon said, hey, these aren't going to work. We need to make sure that this is a unique barcode just for your products. And so, you know, it, it caused a little bit of a mess. And I can explain exactly why that happens. So we talk a lot at GS1 about standards, right? And um, this might give you a little bit of stress looking at this image. It gives me a little bit of stress if you've been um, a traveler overseas um, to Europe or whatever. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a standardized way for us to have outlets, you know, kind of the same way like we scan barcodes. Um, so this is an example of why standards are needed. So there's one common business language for global commerce that helps keep the supply chain efficient, transparent, and safe. And this UPC barcode underpins all of that, really. It's a, it's a backbone of how we move products from point A to point B. Um, so the way that, um, that you approach your building your own supply chain, um, setting them up right from the beginning um, to make sure that they identify your products correctly and can be trackable by all of your retail partners is the beauty of this kind of standardi standardization. If you imagine all of these plugs to be different retail partners that you could work with, one is Walmart, one is Amazon, one is Chewy.com, you know, you would have a heck of a time and spend a lot of, of energy 
trying to translate, okay, this is what the requirements are for this retailer. This is what the requirements are for that retailer. And they do vary, um, you know, in, in other aspects, but you don't have to worry about your standardized um, barcodes and the way that you transmit um, standardized information to those retailers. Okay, so moving on to some of those acronyms that I talked about early on, we, I think we're all pretty familiar with the UPC, um, but what's actually in the UPC is this number called the Global Trade Item Number, or we call it a GTIN. And so this is the actual number that identifies your trade items, whatever you're selling. You know, I have if I have a candle company, I might have a vanilla, an orange, and a lavender scented candle. I'm going to need a GTIN for each of those to identify those with a specific number. And we like to say that's almost like a fingerprint for your product. No one else should have that uh, the same um, fingerprint, right? So what you would get from GS1 is this issued uh, this number that gets encoded into the UPC barcode. So the UPC stands for the Universal Product Code, and it's the predominant barcode used in the United States and other countries like we talked about. Um, there are slight variations, like in Europe, they have something called the EAN barcode. It's kind of just a shortened version of that with um, different digits encoded into it, but that's also GTIN based. Um, so this is the, the UPC is the actual symbol made of lines and spaces read by the scanner. It's what goes beep. The number within it is actually pretty powerful because you can use that by itself in a product listing for Amazon or other online marketplaces. And you could very well never put a barcode on your, um, your product. So it's not all about the barcode. It is that number that's going to identify your product and give it this, um, this identity in the supply chain. So just a little um, information to level set there about what we're talking about. And so I've probably said the word unique a lot <laughs> at this point, but what do I really mean by unique identification? Um, from the retailer's perspective, they get products all the time. They're inundated with products. You know, hopefully it's coming in some kind of organized manner. Um, oh, I have a question here. It just says uh, UPC and GTINs are universal. Uh, are they universal? Um, so yeah, we, we like to say they're accepted by most retailers. I can't guarantee you that every single retailer accepts GTIN or, or UPC. So, um, uh, but it is used around the world, right? So if I'm selling, take Amazon, for example, we love selling through Amazon because it gives you exposure to a global audience much more than you can do from your local, you know, regional footprint. Um, so those, yes, that GTIN is going to be universal used when you think about the grand scheme of, um, of uh, e-commerce. So if is your GTIN linked to your company? Um, does it identify the product that it should? These are all the questions that retailers want to know. Because if you think about it, if they have something in their inventory that doesn't compute, it makes it a lot easier for them to promise something to the end customer, to, to us as end customers. Um, so for example, if I have a teddy bear company and I put in my GTIN, you know, I, I sent, I get all set up with, with Amazon. Maybe I, I got my, my GTIN from another party. I don't, I don't, didn't really think about where I got it from, put it into Amazon on my product listing. They kick it back because they are checking against the GS1 database. And it says, this is not registered to a teddy bear company. It's registered to a lamp company. Um, and it might be uh, located in somewhere completely different from where I'm located. And so they'll say, until you resolve this, we can't list your product or we're going to suppress your, your product listing. Um, so when you go to GS1, you're getting the, the right building blocks and the right numbers to make sure that it comes up in the system as saying, I'm Caitlin's teddy bear company. This is a blue teddy bear. So that is what we mean by uniqueness and what you know an ident identity of a product is, is um, can the retailer and wh whatever partner, a distributor, a hospital, whoever you're working with, understand what that product is right away by um, from its GTIN, from its you know UPC, if you will. And so this is a screenshot of a free service that we actually have on our website, gs1us.org, where you could type in whatever. If you if you have come across barcodes that you don't know where they came from, you can put that in, and it'll tell you what company it's from, and vice versa. You can put in the company, and it'll tell you you know some other information about it too. Um, let me here. I love seeing more questions in here too. Thank you so much. I'm going to think on, um, okay, so let's deposit. In, this is actually a good segue. Are UPCs and GTINs required for B2B software also? Um, I have a slide um, later on that will address um, some solution partners that we work with, but there are quite a bit of tech platforms 
And um, if you're familiar with the retail system, ERP systems, like that's it, like the ordering systems for retailers um, that embed GS1 standards in their solutions. So what do, what do I mean by embed? Where they will have a column, you know, in their interface that says, what's your product GTIN? And you will have to enter that to kind of help understand what's the, what's the record of what's being transmitted and shipped and received. Um, so I hope that answers your question too, where it's, it is embedded in B2B software because it kind of helps support logistics and shipping and all those things. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. And so um, to go deeper into that, let's let's talk about just like the benefits of, of these types of barcodes and why you want it to be authentic. So when you're starting out and you might be really, really early on in your journey and you're saying, okay, do I want to um, still sell in stores? Do I want to sell on e-commerce? Do I want to do both? And both is called um, omni-channel retailing is kind of a kind of a buzzword, but I think it accur accurately captures that you are um, you're exploring all options. You're, you're you want to try out some brick and mortar, and you also want to maybe be on Amazon or have a Shopify store. Um, so let me take you through some of the benefits. There's some unique and some common. Um, if you're selling in stores, um, this could be you know boutiques. It could be your Publix grocery store, or you know here in New Jersey we have Shoprite, we have Stop and Shop. Um, this is the thing that um, that goes beep at the point of sale, right? You just that's those, those are table stakes for a retailer deal. Is you need to have that product uh, um, barcoded, and it needs to be able to go beep and pass through the point of sale and be read. Um, so that's a, a major benefit. A retailer is going to say, "You absolutely need that." Um, for it to be accepted by the store system, so to be like that's what we're talking about with these B two B systems, their ERPs for shipping and receiving and inventory management. Where is it in the merchandising scheme? Um, the the GTIN or the barcode will underpin all of those processes, and to track your sales data. So this is a benefit to you, where every time your product gets scanned, you might get information back from that retailer to say, okay. Um, Caitlin, your vanilla candles are are outperforming the lavender. You know, maybe I want to think about not producing as many lavenders and bumping up my production of the the vanilla candles. And I know that some small businesses will maintain their own kind of spreadsheets where um, they have the the GTIN as the main identifier, and it'll say, okay, the vanillas are doing well at Walmart. They're not doing so well at this boutique. Maybe I need to you know kind of check what my my store mix is there by this sales data. And you have that one identifier across all. Um, so I'm going to jump to the right-hand column to the e-commerce side. Um, I have to move my camera here because I can't see it. Okay. Um, a big benefit for e-commerce selling is kind of what I talked about before, where you're using that number by itself. You might not even have a barcode on your product, although we kind of recommend it because consumers, you know, I look for that when I get something from Amazon. It's kind of a... Um, a symbol of credibility, it makes me know, okay, this is a legitimate brand that's got a barcode on it. Um, but you can take that GTIN, you can use it in your product listing, and it'll help with the, the search um, indexing so that when uh, when people are searching for like cool mist humidifier or something, there's that's a competitive market, by the way. So to be able to surface um, your product in the results, you want everything, all firepower behind that to be able to land in that search at the right time for the right customer. And the GTIN is just kind of a piece of that backend uh, supply chain data that can help make that happen. Um, authenticity is a big thing on e-commerce platforms. Um, when you think about Amazon and Walmart and how every retailer kind of has their own marketplace now, the marketplaces are just growing um, exponentially. There's a lot of uh, opportunity for counterfeiters and bad actors to to be introduced into that setting. Um, they could um, set up duplicate listings of your product. Um, it's called hijacking and kind of steal some of your sales away or, or even some of your brand equity, right? So it's kind of, it's a, it's a problem and it kind of dilutes what you're trying to do on those platforms. And um, if you have your barcodes registered from GS1, we give you a certificate that says, um, here's your GS1 company prefix or my, my GS1 G10 certificate. You can go to Amazon and say, you know, I'm the rightful owner of this listing. And I'd like you to look into my case. And like, I'm, I would like that other one, that other listing suppressed, you know, I'm the authentic owner. And it's, it gives you a leg to stand on. I mean, it's, it's part of their, um, their process of validating who the rightful owner is and, and weeding that out. Um, but it's a big part of it to be able to say, I, this is, this is proof that I am who I am. Um, and then also it just kind of helps match the customer need, kind of like what we were saying. When you're when you're shopping online, you won't have um, 
the ability to touch and see and feel and smell those candles. So you have to pay attention to that A plus content. This is a Amazon lingo. Now they talk about A plus content on all of your product listings to really paint the picture about what the product is. So why would you go through all the trouble to be that descriptive and, and use that marketing language without the proper identifier to pull that all together, right? It's almost useless if you don't have both working together for you. Okay. Um, all right. Let me just check some of these questions as we go. Does, uh, you know, I can address the um, overseas um, exporting in a little while. And for the service-based companies that are on, um, I did want to call out, this is that may be interesting to you as a consumer, but there are um, applications for barcodes and these identifiers for things like legal entities. Um, I know in a lot of our paperwork, we have barcodes on them to, ac you know, to accurately track them as they move through a large organization. So for a service business, you might think about that kind of application of UPCs and, um, and QR codes are being used more and more for those purposes. Um, this is primarily talking about the movement of goods and products, though. So you never know if you're going to start your Amazon side hustle one day. This could, this information could be um, could be helpful. All right, let's move on. So once you determine that you okay, I'm ready to mass produce my product. I'm ready to um, to get on the Amazon or one of these retailers. I really want to attract new business. Um, I'm ready to to calculate how many barcodes I need. I did just want to walk you through this process because there um, it's kind of a, a beginner um, learning curve to understand, okay, I need a G10 for every variation, for every style, color, flavor, scent, you know, back to my candle example, I would need three G10s for those, um, those three candles uh, because I have vanilla, orange, and, and uh, lavender. But think about how it could really add up if you're in apparel. So that has all these different variations you have to think of. I have a t-shirt company. Okay, I've got small, medium, and large. Great, three barcodes. But then wait, I've got blue, pink, and purple. So that's really nine barcodes. And I've got um, short sleeve shirts, long sleeve shirts, and three quarter length. Okay, now we're talking 27. And now you can see if you add in packaging, that really just means now I've gone from three to 81. So it, it's, a, it's a reality in some industries. CPG can kind of be like that when you have um, different flavors. And then, you know, you have a large size granola bars or a bite size granola bar. Um, there's different considerations that you just need to be prepared for and kind of accurately say, okay, I am going to need to devote more um, investment and more of my budget to this, to developing my supply chain. If I have all these different variations and you may choose, um, maybe I'm only going to do the three quarter length t-shirts on, uh, on Amazon. And so I only need barcodes for those and that color and that sizing. Um, a lot of people do that. They test a product line and see how it does with one of the retailers. Or the retailer might say, we're really only interested in those three quarter lengths. We got a lot of short sleeve. Um, so you may choose to segment off certain product lines and certain variations and then maybe branch out um, once you've had some success. All right. So moving on. And we have a barcode calculator just like this on our website too. And so Let's take that a step further, right? Because I did mention if you are on um, an online platform and you get a GS1 company prefix certificate. So let me explain a little bit what a company prefix is. Um, it really is a number that we assign to you. Um, that's your building block for creating those GTINs yourself and assigning GTINs yourself. So once you determine, okay, I need 81, um, we have what we call capacity-based pricing. So if you need 10 barcodes, it starts at $250 with a renewal fee. We also have 1,000 barcodes, 10,000, 100,000. So it really depends on how many products you see um, being sold from your, from your product line and how many variations you have there. And then we give you the power to assign those GTINs as you go. So you'll get this prefix, you know, say my prefix is 06141, um, 4141. Um, I'm going to take that and that's going to be in every G10 on all of my products. So it's almost like my own personal stamp as my company owner is going to be included on all those um, EPCs and all those barcodes and every product listing. So that goes back to that really important connection between the company or the brand and the product that those retailers are looking for that consistency. 
And so this was really important. Um, a, a great point that one of our small business uh, members made, this woman, Felicia Vieira, she's the founder of Crafted Brand Company. They're um, mixers, like if you're uh, into mixology and um, mocktails and cocktails. So she had told us, um, I'm so glad you're talking about the GS1 company prefix. I didn't really understand it at first. And so many aspects of our growth rely on the GS1 company prefix. It's important to know what's coming after you get your barcode and anticipate what the retailer will ask of you. So what she's talking about there is there are other identifiers um, similar to the GTIN, to the product identifier, that identify locations. So if you grow to the point where you have a couple warehouses, a couple stores, um, you're working with a retailer and they need to know exact traceability, especially of like a food product, because there's a lot of new food safety regulations that are going to be implemented um, from the FDA in the next few years. Um, they might need you to identify it with these global location numbers. And so you would start with this company prefix, this um, this branding that says uh, this is Caitlin's Candle Company. Um, and then you'd create different numbers from that um, for location and then even for shipping and logistics barcodes. And I'll get to, I have a slide on this shipping and logistics barcodes as well. So it's more than identifying products. You're really, um, you're creating your supply chain, like we said. And this is that basic building block that, that really opens a lot of doors for a lot of possibilities for what you can do with your shipping and logistics partners and your retail partners. Okay, so just a little bit on exactly how you create these numbers and how you keep it all um, organized. We do, when you become a member, you get access to a free tool called Data Hub. Um, this is where you'll have your, your prefixes managed in here and be able to go in and say, okay, I'm ready to put barcodes on the lavender scented candle. I need to go in there and create a G10 and then pull down a barcode, share that with my packaging partner and we'll be good to go. Or I say, I just need to create the G10 and get that listing right up on Amazon. Um, so you would go into our system. We actually have a, a great data hub help center that gives you a lot of videos and just kind of helps you show exactly how that is. But it just, the, the point of kind of showing you this is that you have control over how your GTINs are assigned and when. Um, so it'll help you uh, also maintain some accurate product information in there too. So you can store things like um, weights and dimensions. You can store brand descriptions. Um, just so you have one, I mean, one hub, it's actually very accurately named, to have all that information set up so that you can be ready to share with those retail partners. And if you do it once, and then you add all these retail partners, you know you've already got it. So it's it's kind of like a set it and forget it. You can upload, you know, upload all your data and then be able to share that um, with anybody new who comes along. And I do want to mention that we have solution partners. So this goes back to the question about B2B software. Um, there's a lot of companies out there that specialize just in um, barcode creation and verification, labeling partners, um, and we have properly vetted them. So it's actually quite a lengthy vetting process where we say, okay, you can be a GS1 solution partner. Um, so you know that they're qualified and they understand kind of the supply chain standards lingo. Um, so you might want to check those out if you have a need, um, and especially as you grow for um, supply chain planning resources and maybe even RFID if you grow to that point of needing something to help you just get through your inventory management and your cycle counts a little bit more. There's a lot of different types of, of um, software and tech partners to explore there. Okay, so getting in a little bit detailed and um, again, there's more information on our website about this, but I did, it, I did want you to know that it's not just about putting a barcode on your product. There's different kind of packaging levels to understand that um, that retailers might ask you to package your products into. I don't want you to be blindsided by it. So um, we've been talking mainly about putting a barcode on a singular product. So we call that the H. Um, this is the lowest level of packaging. So it's, um, it's the item intended for sale, right? We see that commonly on something that is, um, you know, at, that you buy at Costco or something in bulk. That would be at this case level where you, you might open up, uh, my kids eat a lot of fruit snacks, right? And on the fruit snack uh, package, doesn't have a barcode and it says not intended for individual sale. That's because it's part of a case, right? So this is that intermediate packaging of the same trade item. I'm sorry, this is the inner pack. I will get to the case. Um, <laughs> case is coming next. Um, of the same trade item or some kind of predefined assortment of trade items. And it, they all are marked with that same G10, that same UPC, and it's um, purchasable by consumer. So you can 
Um, that's just something specific in Data Hub. I wouldn't worry about that right now, but it just um, is something that retailers may ask you um, depending on how they sell their products or how they like to receive. Um, you might be dealing with some inner packs. Okay, now the case is a standard shipping unit that contains eaches, either individually or grouped as an inner pack, and all the items must have the same GTIN. Um, mixed cases are going to have, you guessed it, mixed cases. So in the case of this um, image, a mixed case might have half strawberry jam and half grape jam. And right here, the picture shows all strawberry. So sometimes we we actually term things that uh, in ways that make sense. Um, the palette comes into play with your shipping and logistics partners. It's a shipping unit that either that contains either cases, inner packs, or eaches, and it must contain one type of GTIN regardless of the number of items in the grouping. So it's just kind of important. I think about it, how your partners are gonna be receiving it. You wanna make it as easy as possible for them to understand what's coming, what's being shipped, you know, how it makes it easier to unpack and to put on the shelf. Okay, so um, another kind of, let's pull back the, the layer of the onion with the barcode and the GTIN. Um, as you grow, you might be thinking about changing your packaging, changing your formulation if you have you know, a fruit snack company or a granola company or, or a, a jam. Um, and you have to think about, okay, well, I've, I've got these GTINs, I've, I've got my prefix, I've assigned them, but now I want to change the packaging, I want to change the label, I want to change this, I want to change that. Um, does it mean that you need a new GTIN? Does it mean you have to come back to us and say, okay, maybe I need another prefix because I've changed, I've rebranded. Um, so there's a few guiding principles, and it doesn't mean that you have to in every case. So that's the good news. Um, the guiding principles center around, is it a, a impact to the consumer? Is there a regulatory consideration? And is there a substantial impact to the supply chain? So let me explain a little bit more in detail. The consumer impact is, is the, the person purchasing it or your training partner able to say, okay, this is different from what I'm used to, or it's pretty much the same as what I'm used to seeing. So in that case, it could be an example is like a different font. So if I have the jar of jam and we've we've updated our logo, we have a different font on the brand, like the lettering just looks different, but it's all the same product. It is the same type of packaging. Um, it's a jar. I didn't suddenly move into like, um, you know, a, a box or something, a bottle or anything like that. Um, so in that case, you wouldn't need a new GTIN if you're just changing the way something looks. Um, but if it becomes a different name or something ju that's just completely different where the consumer says, uh, I'm not sure if this is the granola bar I used to buy, then that needs a new GTIN. Then that's that's a different product. Um, are there regulatory considerations? So this is kind of where it gets into formulation changes. If you are required to disclose allergens or different nutritional information per the FDA, it's something you want to make sure that you have absolutely um, nailed because I think the consumer is just so much more conscious of what's being put into products and what they, um, what products align with their beliefs and their dietary restrictions and, um, and, and allergies. It's really, really important to make sure that you're up to date on what you're required to disclose. So if the FDA, um, I have an example to share with you later in a later slide, if the FDA adds an allergen, you have to be up to date on when, um, if your product contains that allergen, um, should I update my packaging? Do I need a new GTIN to, to make sure I'm I'm all good there? Um, and then is there a substantial impact to the supply chain? So this is uh, any change in a weight or dimension. Um, the, it, this is when you have changed your packaging and you need to kind of make sure you're accurately communicating with your um, shipping and logistics partners and your retailers that they might expect some impact to the way that this gets loaded onto a truck. You know, say I was to go from a jar to a bottle and that glass bottle is much heavier and it's bigger. And so now it's just taking up more weight and space um, in, in the box, in the case, in the truck. Um, that needs to be communicated and labeled appropriately. Um, there is a consideration with changing packaging that if you are changing your packaging within 20% of a, of a change, you can keep that GTIN. So if it would have to be a major change and a major addition to the weight. I hope that makes sense. That might be a little uh, confusing. We can share some links in the chat to more information on that. Okay, so let's go back to some barcode types. Um, we, we talked a lot about the, that top line with the, the UPC the one that we've most commonly seen. 
that's where we're encoding our GTINs and putting it on our packaging, on our eaches. <laughs> and then um, the EAN is commonly used in Europe as well. Um, data bar you've probably seen on pieces of fruit. So like your banana, your apples, those things that you peel off before you start eating. Those are the GS1 data bars. And um, boy, was that a, a game changer in the checkout line just to be able to um, speed that process along to make sure that those items could be checked out and recognized. Um, logistics barcodes, I touched on this a little bit. These are the barcodes that you've probably seen on shipping labels or on corrugated boxes mm -hmm. um, to, that are really important for your, your shipping and logistics partners to scan as things move from point A to point B, as they pick up in different locations. And there might also be proprietary barcodes along with these GS1 barcodes on those packages. So UPS might have their own version, DHL might have their own version. Um, it can be kind of confusing to kind of see what, what barcode is for, for which purpose. Um, but the important thing to realize about these particular barcodes, especially the GS1-128, if you have a food brand or something in a regulated industry, these GS1-128s are pretty cool because if you put them on the, um, the carton, the, the numbers are much longer, right? So they have the ability to encode not only the GTIN of the product included, but what batch or lot they came from and their expiration date and other information. So it can all be kind of encoded with those numbers. I won't get too technical, but it does come in handy for things uh, in the event of a recall. So if you remember a couple of years ago, there were a few romaine lettuce recalls. It just, it seemed like it was happening like every season, right? Um, there were so many grocery stores that really just had to wipe out all of their romaine lettuce because they weren't sure. It took a really long time to trace exactly what happened there. They weren't sure where it came from. They didn't want to have more people get sick. They wanted to keep their consumers safe. Um, but what if we could be more specific about the lot and batch where that was grown to be able to understand, okay, this, this is the um, batch that is affected, not this. This is safe. We have the data to back it up. So I think the industry is getting much, much better at really being able to pinpoint that and um, reduce food waste in those instances. Okay, and so this is the really exciting part, the 2D barcodes. We've talked a lot about QR codes being, um, it, I think during the pandemic, we all were just kind of scanning QR codes more and more. It was, it was very normalized to be able to, to scan QR codes and menus and um, just use it as something that was a little more um, distance friendly. Um, so the QR codes that you're used to scanning on the products, oh, I had a Diet Coke can, um, on a soda can, you might see it, and it says smart label or scan here for, for points. Um, obviously, brands are already using QR codes a lot to, to in, engage the consumer. But what we're going to see, and I have um, some more information on the next slide, is that QR code is going to serve all of these purposes. It's going to serve the purpose of the UPC and go beep at checkout, as well as be scannable by your smartphone. So you get all that information that you need about sustainability, about it could be whatever the brand wants to push out to you. And so you guys as brand owners or somebody who, um, who sells products, you might think about how you want to um, collect some data and tell your story through the QR code, because I think you're going to start to see it being used even more than we do today. And so we're calling this um, like the 2D movement, right? So, and, and in, you know, actually GS1 US has another movement called Sunrise 2027. So let me explain that and because there's kind of two parts of this. We need the brands to start thinking about what stories they're going to tell and they're already off and running. We need the retailers to be able to update their infrastructure so that the 2D barcode can be scanned at that checkout line. If you try and scan a QR code now, it, it, it won't work. It's only able to read. Uh, a UPC. So we think by 2027, all of that's going to reach a critical mass with the retailers adopting new technology, new optical readers. Um, and so by that time, you know, we're kind of pushing out to small businesses and big businesses saying, um, what's the story you're going to tell? What's the added benefit on the back end of the bar of, of the supply chain too? Because if you're enabling so much more data to be packed into this QR code. The, the UPC is great and it's been around for 50 years, if you can believe that. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the barcode scan in June. It was in 1974. Um, but few technologies have really lasted 50 years like that. I think when we were doing research, we found that the floppy disk was also invented <laughs> that same year. And I don't know about you, I'm not using any more floppy disks, but I am using the barcode. Um, but it really can only do one thing. It can tell you this is what this item is and this is what the price is. But a QR code can tell you so much more. It can tell you 
um, the origins of that product. It can tell you, is this recalled? You know, it's it's real time information so that the store associates aren't, you know, um, cleaning all the, the shelves off and not really even knowing where the source of the recall is from or what it's about. What if the brand could push out that information through the QR code and say, hey, don't buy this. This is recalled. Put it, you know, please see a store associate to dispose of it. Um, all that can happen quicker than what's what's happening today, unfortunately. So um, there's also some benefits from the brand side to the backend supply chain data that's available through the QR code. We had a, a panel discussion recently um, at, with Inc. Magazine down in San Antonio, and a, a brand owner, her name is Psyche Terry, she runs a company called Urban Hydration, and it's all natural skincare products. And she's already using QR codes on her on her products. Um, she likes to say, you know, we were like the cereal box of, of skincare until we started using QR codes. And it's a much easier way to tell your story and um, show all of your claims for sustainability and things like that. Um, but she said, you know, early on in her process, they had made a mistake with the UPC. Um, the wrong number got encoded into it. There was just a readability error. Um, and wouldn't it be nice if uh, with a with a QR code that doesn't have the same kind of technology and func functionality, she could have made that correction without having to relabel that product with a new barcode because the code is just the vehicle for more information. It's the vehicle for that same GTIN that we've been talking about. And then it also carries so much more data. So you can tell I'm really excited about that. I I'm excited as a consumer as well as, you know, somebody from GS1, you know, helping to move this on. Okay. And if you would like to know more about this, this will get you even more excited. Um, this is a video that we did with um, a senior vice president from PepsiCo. Um, this is what I was talking about, where if you think about PepsiCo, they have a lot of different brands. They have chip brands, pretzel brands. It's not just soda. And he tells this story about when a new allergen was added to the U.S. allergen list. It was sesame. And if you think about, you know, how much time it takes for packaging, like printed packaging to be updated, it's usually 18 to 24 months before that gets onto the packaging after that change is announced. So you could save all that time, you know, for people who are allergic to sesame, that's a long time to wait to know if a product is able to be consumed or not. With that QR code, you can push out more data without having to relabel your packaging and without having to get a new barcode. So it's, um, it feels like it's almost magic, right? But it will create so much more efficiency for us as consumers and the ability to, um, to kind of communicate that, that information directly from the brand with your target consumer in a way that we haven't been able to do before. Okay, so I hope this is all really valuable information, but I did wanna close by just having you hear it from another small GS1 US member. This is Sonia Hernandez. She's the founder of Recover, Restore, Grow in Sacramento. Um, it's a she has a great story. You should check out the video that we did with her. Um, they're hair care products that are all plant based, and she discovered this company after many of her family members were going through breast cancer and losing their hair, and they needed a natural way to kind of um, help regrow it. And so it's a fabulous product. And she says, um, if you think small, you're going to stay small, but if you think bigger, you're going to grow. So that's just, I, I thought that captures our motto at GS1 US so, so well, um, where you can, you, you don't have to think about barcodes or care about barcodes if you are just kind of unsure about where you're going to go. And maybe this business won't last more than a year. If you're really on that growth track and you think you've got something here, you've got a great idea, you're a, one of these passionate inventors that I've been describing, um, you're, it, it's worth it to understand how you're going to build your supply chain from the very beginning, the, the right way, so that you can have this longevity and, uh, and have the potential for even more profit. So I would love it if you wanted to connect with me on LinkedIn. This is also how you can contact me if you have any questions. I see some questions in the Q&A already. I don't know if we've gotten to all these yet. Um, okay. Let me see. Uzma, would you like me to just kind of cover those or um, how do you want to? Yeah, run? please go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Feel free to. Awesome. Okay. I see one from Manuel. Does, uh, does it allow you to find the manufacturers or distributors either domestically or overseas? So maybe this was in relationship to what I showed where you can go to our website and put in the G10 and understand who owns it. It is a basic response, Manuel. It's um, It really just says, this GTIN is licensed to 
XYZ company. They are located in Freehold, New Jersey. So if you're looking for domestic or overseas, it will tell you if it's um, you know, in the US or not just by, by that basic information. Um, I should mention that there are other GS1 organizations too. So if you go to gs1.org, that's our global organization, they might have similar tools. So if you know that your products are coming from Australia or something like that, you might want to look at, well, does GS1 Australia have a tool that will help me identify it? Um, I think I think most GS1s have similar tools, but they are, they are really varied, honestly, um, by different organizations, what they offer on their website. Okay, and James says, my business is not product-based, more service-related. Can this be an effective strategy? You know, I think we just kind of um, talked about how um, the the application of, you know, legal entity barcoding and things that aren't product-based. Um, I hope this was helpful if you uh, are ever thinking of, of becoming a retailer brand. Okay, and another question. I would like clarification regarding the use of the word authenticity in e-commerce as my brain goes to branding and marketing. Okay, I'm with you. I'm a, I'm a marketer too. In the context of UPCs, authenticity is the ability to prove your products are legitimate. Is this mostly for when you encounter hijackers and need evidence? Yeah, I, I, I believe so. I think that's the main benefit here because, you know, it's still getting a G10, getting a prefix, becoming a GSO member is all originated by you, the brand owner. So whatever information that you give us goes into the system, right? So you're, whatever company you're doing business as, you know, you can put it into our, our system and, and that's what it will be in the GS1 database. So if you want to think about that long-term, how do I want Amazon to recognize me and my brand? Um, so you have to make sure that that's set up right from the beginning. But yeah, authenticity is really to say, um, if there's ever, if you're, if your listing is ever called into question, if um, if there's suddenly, like I said, this hijacker that comes and says, uh, well, this is my listing now, and they could even take your pictures. It's kind of crazy. And it's, it's sad because it takes business away from the small businesses that have really done all the legwork, done all the work, right? It's, it's not fair. And Amazon doesn't like it either. So they want um, a clear process and a clear way for you to prove who you are and say, this is my product and it's linked to me. And so um, the the company prefix, uh, I don't know if when you asked this question, we had gotten to the company prefix yet. So maybe this makes sense now. That company prefix is that stamp of saying, this is Caitlin's Candles. And then the rest of the numbers identify the actual product. So within that number, it tells a story. So I think that hopefully that's helpful. And especially in e-commerce, because we found that you can't really reuse a GTIN anymore. You used to be able to. I think prior to 2017, 2018, we changed the rules. And we're finding that there was so much confusion when if you had ever listed that product, it would stay on the internet forever, right? It's like, it's hard. There's no nobody out there kind of saying, okay, that product isn't on the market anymore. I'm going to take that down. There's websites, there's eBay, there's different um, avenues where um, that, that GTIN is just, it's somewhere. It's somewhere where somebody can find it. So we unfortunately can't reuse GTINs in this digital world with some exceptions too. And I see the question, how is it different from an ASIN? So thank you for asking that because I did mention Amazon quite a bit. Um, so it's different from an ASIN with a simple answer that the ASIN is their internal product uh, identif identification system. So, and you might run into that with other retailers, but Amazon is a really good example. So Amazon does require you to have a GS1 UPC, um, but it, you know they have to put that in when you're listing your product. Um, but they also will assign you a, an ASIN, which really helps, especially if you if you know Amazon. There's two sides of becoming a seller. You use fulfillment by Amazon or vendor um, fulfillment. The fulfillment by Amazon is primarily used by small businesses because Amazon will do all the work to um, to send out your products when you get new orders. So they need that ASIN to kind of keep their own fulfillment system in order with the added layer of the, the G10, that global identifier, um, as, as proof of authenticity, as um, you know, a credibility builder. So it's having both in combination helps with their particular fulfillment system. I hope that was helpful. Um, let me just take a sip. And if I'm missing anything in the chat, here we go. Okay. Thank you, Uzma. I see you've directed everybody to the Q&A side. 
Um, could you comment on the role of blockchain in this area? Oh, I used to, I was in the public relations department for a little while, and we used to um, do a lot of thought leadership and a lot of interviews with our subject matter experts on blockchain. And I want to say this was like 2018 when blockchain was really, um, it was the buzzword of the year. So we build a blockchain-based clinical trial software that has a supply chain module that tracks clinical drugs as they're sent to the doctor or patients. Wow, that's that's a great technology to have. Um, so the role of blockchain um, in using GS1 standards is these numbers that I'm talking about, the global trade item number, the global location number actually is very important in product traceability for an FDA regulated industry. Um, so those would be pieces of information that get recorded on a blockchain. And so if you know blockchain well, and I'm sure you do Rama, is uh, it's, a, it's a recorded, it's a ledger that cannot be edited. Um, and that's what people like about it is this immutability where all the information follows the product or the thing that you're tracking on a blockchain. And it, every participant in the, that supply chain or in that, that chain of some kind can see the product history and know that it hasn't been tampered with and and everybody's reading off of the same um, the same manual, if you will. So I think that would be really important, especially as um, your regulations in the drug industry, such as the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, which you might be familiar with. Um, we work closely, we have a whole team devoted to it, working closely with the FDA to understand how these numbers and these standards can be the basic format to enable um, just better traceability to help keep counterfeit drugs out of, of the supply chain and just make sure that there's expiration dates being tracked accurately and everybody's getting the proper medication that they should and, and there's less room for error. Hopefully that helped. Um, next question, my product cost is very less. What's the price to buy UPC code? Okay, great. So we have a, we have a few different flexible options. The cheapest is a single barcode, a single GTIN, that's $30 outright. There's no renewal fee with that. And we recommend that if you have products, if you have 10 or fewer products, the single GTIN is a great way to get started. Or like what I what I described where I have that candle company, I know my vanilla is the strongest. Maybe I get one single GTIN and I test that out on Amazon and I see how it does. But we kind of think that that's like a temporary solution to what you might need to estimate your growth, like with that estimator graphic. Because if I have a longer term plan where I'm like, you know what, maybe it's better off that I get this company prefix and I can build my, my GTINs and my barcodes as I, as I grow, I've got a, you know, a three-year plan. And I, I think that I'm, I'm ready to, to make sure I can support that um, mass scale production. So um, our, our company prefix options are, it starts um, with a pack of 10 barcodes for $250. And then you're going to have a $50 renewal fee every year. Um, you can look at our website. I, I'm not sure of the other levels, but that's uh, 10 is kind of the most popular for a small business audience, um, maybe a hundred as well. So if you're in that apparel industry, you might need the hundred pack. Um, I, I would encourage everybody to see that as an investment in your supply chain. You're building it the right way. You're ensuring that um, it's unique. Those numbers are unique. No one else is going to have that um, company prefix assigned to you. And so you are paying for the right to maintain that uniqueness. And we're not going to give that number to anybody else. Okay. Does it help to fight counterfeiting? Um, I hope that that was answered before. We talked a lot about Amazon, but I'm sure that that's true with other um, industries and other platforms is that that connection from your brand to your product is, is really, really valuable. Okay. And, um, and Rama, absolutely. I will direct you to more information on the global location number. Definitely. Okay. And Patrick says, I just want to make sure I have this correct. The QR codes information can be changed in real time. Yes. So if you are experimenting with QR codes right now, um, let me give you the example. I put um, a QR code in my presentation. And what I did with that is I generated a QR, you know, for free on a website. Um, and I put in the URL that I wanted embedded into that QR code. So if I do this presentation for a healthcare industry and I wanna change that QR code to just our healthcare related videos, I can change um, that, that URL and use the same QR code. Um, well, yes, you would have to update. Yeah, you know what? We'll have to, I'll have to, I'll have to phone a friend on that. 
Um, but there is a way, I know, through the packaging that you're going to create it on the back end and you're probably going to use our data hub tool. Like I said, 2027 is the goal that that ability is not there yet. Um, for, for my marketing you know, QR code, I guess I would have to use a new QR there. But I know that our experts are out there talking about the ability to push out that information and not have to change packaging. So it's a little different than how we're using QR codes now. Um, the, the standards behind it, it's called the digital link standard web enables that barcode. So it kind of makes um, all that, that supply chain information um, into a URL that can be changed um, on the back end. So I, I'd be happy to direct you to more information on that. So thank you for, for stumping me a little bit there. <laughs> okay, let's see, barcode line. Okay, did that one. Um, Claire says, I wholesale my handmade products and I'm stepping into a new relationship with a retail group that requires me to label my products with UPC stickers. I've never needed this and they offer a third party to create the UPC and print the stickers. So this has been helpful information. Oh, great. I, I'm glad there's not even a question in there. I'm just glad that this is helpful information. But yeah, you raised a good point, Claire. Um, she says, because now I see the value of the protection and I can compare the cost to. Um, so you raise a good point though about there, um, there are labelers, there are people who create the actual stickers. It's up to you as the brand owner though, to make sure that that number is what you own. So I would be careful if somebody is offering you a sheet of UPCs and saying, go put these on your product and you don't know where the, that number came from. So you can go on our website, you can check that GTIN and say, you know, <laughs> kind of like my teddy bear and lamp company example. Um, is this even registered to me? So um, it's be it's always better when it's registered, that number is registered to you, regardless of if you're printing it directly on your packaging or you're creating stickers. Okay, and Cole says, can you explain to me what's the difference between a GTIN and a GLN? My company purchased a 100 UPC code and is using some of them now. Great, well, thank you for being a member. Um, the simple difference between a GTIN and a GLN is that the GTIN is the global trade item number um, trade item being the appropriate word there, and you can substitute trade item for product. So GTINs are for labeling products, and uh, GLN global location number is for um, identifying locations. So what do I mean by locations? It could be something as big as um, a warehouse, it could be a hospital, it could be a dock door of, um, of a distribution center, of a grocery store, it could even be as, um, as detailed as a shelf. So if you're thinking, if you're at, I don't know, Costco or some somewhere like that, they might have a global location number to identify a shelf or in one of those massive warehouses. I mean, if you've seen some of the footage of the Amazon warehouses where they have all those robots picking and packing, identifying specific shelves in those scenarios are really, really important. So global locations can, numbers can be used for that. They can also be used, like I said, for um, farming locations, like uh, where did this harvest come from? Did it come from this lot and this batch and this pack house? And you know what batch was it? Um, so the global location number is really versatile if you need to track specific um, product. We call it product provenance. My blockchain person will probably be familiar with that term. Um, but it, what it really means is like the chain of custody. Where did this product go? Um, I need to know, was uh, can I trace the steps um, two steps behind and two steps forward. Uh, so that's usually what's required in some of the new traceability rules. So if we moved a warehouse after assigned GTIN, do we have to update the GTIN also? I don't think so because you have the company prefix and that is your basic building block for both. So when you get a company prefix, you have the ability to also um, create GTINs from that. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, G global locations from that. So it should be, um, there should be some kind of separation when you're in Data Hub. Um, and feel free to reach out to me if you need more information on that, um, where you're keeping track of your GTINs and you're keeping track of your global location numbers. You shouldn't have to um, like substitute one for the other or um, it, it should be a part of that package. Um, I hope that answered your question. All right. I think it did. Um, all right, so I think that concludes our Q&A session. Mm -hmm. And that was a wonderful Q&A session. Thank you for being so um, you know, detailed about the answers. I'm sure our audience appreciates it a lot. And yes, uh, we've gotten comments that, um, you know, this has been very uh, valuable. 
So I'm just going to ask you, Caitlin, to, I know you had it on the slide, but if you can just put in your contact information in the chat. Oh, yeah, of course. Yep. So if you can just put it there, I know we had a disclaimer for not, uh, you know, taking uh, videos or pictures. Yes, no problem. Um, awesome. In the meantime, while you do that, let me share my screen and... I can show everybody where they can find our website as well as our library, our webinar library. Okay, so I've talked about ngsbc.com. This is our website. Uh, if you're familiar, uh, that's awesome. If you are new, if you have not visited our website, this is ngsbc.com. Right when you go to our website, you'll see request counseling. So if you are, um, you know, if you are already, whether you are an aspiring entrepreneur or if you are already in business, if you'd like to grow your business, we can help you. Uh, so you can just select your, you know, you put in your information, your county. Uh, so here's the catch and just for DC, New Jersey. So we can only serve clients in New Jersey. All right. So if you are a resident of New Jersey or if your small business is in New Jersey, we can certainly counsel you. However, if you are attending from somewhere else, don't worry. The SPDC program, Small Business Development Centers program, is a federal program. So let's say you live in Texas and you would like to receive counseling, then you can certainly go to Google, type in SPDC Texas and uh, any of the 50 states, excuse me, and the territories, uh, you, can, you can find an SPDC. So that's on that. You can find resources. I think I happen to think I know I'm biased, but I happen to think our website is a great resource. Um, you can find blogs, uh, blogs. You can find podcasts. You can find other resources that we can help you with. So let me show you where you can find this webinar when it's recorded and published. We have hundreds and hundreds of videos from our in our library. And the topics just differ from what, like intro to SBIR, SCTR grants. You should definitely put in your email here and sign up for our newsletter. So as part of our tech series, SBIR, SCTR grants, this is in the tech space, R&D space. Or if you'd like to register a business or if you would like to have a business plan for sustainability in business. A lot of different topics. So that's where you can go. And those are our webinars. However, if you'd like to attend statewide events, we do counsel in Spanish, just an FYI. So if you would like to receive counseling in Spanish, just register and let us know. Uh, and we do also have events in Spanish. So you just have to look out. And some of, most of our uh, events and webinars are online nowadays. They are free, but some, you know, they might uh, ask you for a fee. So that's that. And this is an example of the Spanish uh, event that's happening. All right. So I think we've covered a lot during this. We really hope that you can fill out our survey and you can uh, let us know how helpful or not helpful our webinars are. You can tell us. I know Caitlin has been wonderful with our webinar today. So thank you so much, Caitlin, for that. This was a new topic and I think it was very well received by our audience. So thank you for thank having you me. So that was really fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, what's happening next week? We have our as part of our registration series, session 10 with Vanessa, Pro Tips Business Registration with NGSPC Expertise. If you're attending this webinar, this might not be relevant to you because it, you may already be in business. But as our headlines suggested, one of our headlines, we have had many new business applications throughout the nation. So if you have a friend, a family member, or anyone who wants to uh, start a business, then this is the webinar you should direct them to. And as we've talked about QR codes and barcodes and things like that, if you'd like to register, you can scan that QR code or just go to this website that we have, bizregistrationtips.eventbrite, or just go to our Eventbrite page and find awesome information there. So we've been in existence for 45 years now. We've helped 15,000 plus small businesses grow. Again, just a reminder, no cost small business consulting, training events for $100 dollars, exclusive small business resources, 
uh, keep them in mind that our all our counseling is absolutely 100% confidential. All right, so this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for staying with us this far. I uh, hope to see you next week. And with that, this has been great. Take care and see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.